Testing, one, two, three. Is it turned on? Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, we have this talk, then a talk from Thomas, both uh, DDoS related, and after that, finally, the NLNOC quiz with the fantastic prizes. After the quiz, there will be a, a gathering downstairs where we'll drink some beer, wine, or sodas, uh, and there will be pizza and spare ribs. At uh, a quarter to 10, everybody is requested to get out of here. But first, uh, I would like to share uh, with you some uh, uh, information on a small deployment I did uh, of FastNetMon at ColoClue. ColoClue is a uh, non-profit association. It is 100% volunteer driven and many within our community are already participants. Can you raise your hand if you're with ColoClue? Nice, go. It started, uh, I think, 11 or 12 years ago. Uh, some guys thought, uh, it's really nice that we can host our uh, machines at our employers for free, but it's really annoying that every year when we change jobs because we'll get more money or whatever, we have to renumber our IP addresses. Uh, we have to somehow retrieve that server from the employer that might be angry at us. And they thought, why don't we pull together our resources? We'll rent a rack somewhere, get some routers, get an AS number, and just do it ourselves. So most of the participants of ColoClue are network engineers or system administrators. They're, they're our crowd. So today we have two data centers, EU Networks, uh, and uh, DCG. There are a total of four routers. Our total traffic is less than 100 megabit, but we're very fast on our way to become a tier one. Um, <laughs> and we have uh, received two DDoSs in the last year. And that was highly annoying because we are not SLA driven. We have no on-call, there is no knock. Uh, so if somebody happens to be sitting behind their computer to deal with it, then maybe the duration of the outage can be uh, made shorter, but if unlucky, it might last for hours. Small overview, I'm not really good with graphical programs, so I used ASCII. <laughs> we have two routers, EU Networks 1, EU Networks 2, uh, and similar in DCG. Uh, they're participant colocation machines uh, behind those two routers. They are in fillover configured. Uh, and this one has Adam 86 and True Transit. EU Networks 2 has Hibernia, Fiber Ring, and is connected to Amsterdam Internet Exchange. And on the other side, we have uh, a connection to NLAX. And then we have Bit here, who bridge us over the two internet exchanges because we only have one backbone link. Very dirty, but it works. So after that second attack, I thought we should just completely automate this problem away because I don't have any time to deal with this shit, and the network should just manage itself. The ingredients to accomplish this are cheap, easy, and they work. A few years ago, we could not have built the same thing because FastNetMon is not that old. Uh, Bird is very old, but it's uh, become a very robust, reliable uh, routing daemon in the last few years. Uh, and with these ingredients, we can detect an attack within three seconds, and we mitigate it in a second after that. Four seconds from start of attack to just being rid of the problem, which is really nice. And this is all automated. The circle of life of this uh, particular deployment, uh, and this is something you have to really assess for yourselves whether you can do the same approach in your networks, we start here. A DDoS attack is, has started or is happening, one of the two. Packets come in on the EU Networks 2 router. That's this bad boy. Uh, and I, I chose this one because this one runs Ubuntu. FastNetMon runs really well on Ubuntu. Uh, and it has very decent connectivity. So if a DDoS comes in, chances of it passing through that specific uh, device are very high. So the packets come in on EU Networks 2. FastNetMon, after three seconds, will be like, hey, wait a second, something's going wrong. It triggers the shell script. 
that uh, will inject routes into the BERT routing daemon. The BERT routing daemon announces to Hibernia, look guys, we don't need packets anymore for this victim IP address. It waits 60 seconds, it removes the black hole routes, and if three seconds later the trigger happens again, apparently the DDoS was still going on, and if it's not triggered again, the DDoS uh, stopped. So each time after 60 seconds, we lift up our heads, see if something is going, uh, oh, okay, wait, we'll continue black holing. So this method, because we have such rapid detection, we can very rapidly uh, release a victim IP address again back to normal routing. Um, and if, if the DDoS is still continuing, that's no problem because of our fast detection, nobody will even notice. So how this looks in reality. I'm starting a, a DDoS with iperf. I tell it to send uh, five streams, each 200 megabits, to my colocation machine at Coloclue. Within three seconds, our IRC bot will notify the channel, there's a DDoS going on. This is the victim IP address. This is the amount of packets per second we're receiving. So here you can see me cheering, yay, test worked. And then 60 seconds later, it notifies the channel, I've removed the, uh, the black hole. And if it's then triggered again, it will notify again, hey, I've inserted the black hole and this will go back and forth until either a human operator uh, puts a stop to it or the DDoS ceases to be. So what is this Fastnet mon? I quoted from the website, a high-performance DOS DDoS load analyzer built on top of multiple packet capture engines. And they support uh, taking feeds in from uh, uh, either NetFlow v5 or v9, IP fix, you can uh, throw SFlow at it, or, and this is the approach that Coloclue is using, um, on the router itself, in our case it's a Ubuntu box, uh, through the PF ring uh, kernel module, we get uh, snapshots of all the packets that flow through the box at almost no cost. And PF ring will scale easily up to, say, gigabit. If you need to go beyond that, 10 gig, 20 gig, uh, there's a commercial license that is uh, high performance. The commercial license is very cheap, I think like 200 euros a year. Um, or you uh, can use different uh, Linux kernel modules such as NetMap or uh, or you could even do it with PCAPs and replay those. So it doesn't really matter what your source of data is. You can feed it to Fastnetmon and then it can trigger on stuff. There are some gotchas here. The PF ring uh, port mirror trick is very fast because it gets all the packets that pass through the router. So it's assessment, this is above my thresholds, is very quick and accurate because it gets all the packets. And with NetFlow, or, um, it might take up to two minutes before it detects that a DDoS is going on because the NetFlow reporting, uh, it leaves away a lot of the data. Uh, SFlow is faster because of the characteristics of SFlow. So uh, if you deploy this, I would recommend get a Linux box, set up a spam port on your edge routers and feed that spam port directly into Fastnetmon box so you have the quickest results. This is the configuration that Coloclue uses. It's really, it's basically, it's only 25 lines, of which most, uh, the default is fine. There are some interesting configuration options. For instance, uh, I don't care about how many flows per second a machine is receiving, because in our environment, the flows are not uh, of interest to the network itself. I don't really care about packets per second either. For us, uh, where it starts hurting is bandwidth. And if you send us more than a gig, uh, chances are one of our ports congests. So bandwidth is for us the, the, the lowest threshold on which we want to act. Band time, as I mentioned, we set it super low, 60 seconds, because of the fast detection in our environment. I've enabled that it actually does something, because you can also run fastnetmon in reporting only mode, and it will just notify you. Uh, you specify these are the interfaces of interest, so that's uh, a transit link, AMSIX, and that Hibernia link. We use the mirror mode 
uh, option, the, the PF ring module. And if a attack is noticed, execute this shell script. And whatever happens after that, that's not FastNetMon's problem, that is your problem. You specify in a list what your IP space is, so any victim IPs that might be there are contained within these blocks, so it will only look out for packets targeted towards those blocks. This is the shell script that deals with it. Um, FastNetMon passes as arguments the, the rate of the attack, the victim IP address, um, some of that stuff, and then the shell script is executed and can use those variables to accomplish something. And what it does in this case, we need emails on our uh, distribution list for people of interest uh, that have access to routers. And for instance here, argument, uh, if we want the ban action to take action if something happens, send out an email, generate a very small piece of BERT configuration and reload BERT to start announcing those uh, routes. If uh, those se 60 seconds have passed, uh, we want you to remove that BERT specific configuration, reload the daemon, and you can send a notification that the mitigation was withdrawn. Injecting this into BERT is a little bit tricky that's why I put this uh, uh, on the screen so you can later review it. In BERT, you define a separate protocol that is called black hole one. So whatever, in BERT, you can have uh, sort of uh, multiple tables that might interact with each other or might not. Um, and we use this to separate the black hole routes from the, the normal routing because our black hole routes will always be more specific. They are slash 32s and we don't want them to take precedence over the actual routing within our network. And we uh, prevent, by having it in a separate protocol, we prevent uh, that they are redistributed through IBGP. We prevent that the slash 32 is actually programmed in the forwarding information base of that router. So the data plane is uh, separate from the control plane we accomplish here that those more specifics, those black hole routes, are only exist in the control plane and are not actual in the uh, routing tables in the kernel. So this is a small example of what was generated by the, uh, the script. There's a slash 32. This is my IP address, the victim IP address, and it generates the uh, uh, enclosing slash 24. And we do this because if we're under a DDoS, I want to suck in all that DDoS traffic via the transit provider that offers me black holing. So we announce at our peering exchanges uh, slash 21, but during the attack, we will announce a more specific slash 24 via that upstream. So we are uh, reasonably assured that the traffic will come in over the upstream that offers us black holing because our peering partners don't offer us black holing. So we have one route to suck in traffic and a more specific route that is the actual victim IP. And none of this is programmed in VIP. Then in the export policy, um, the first term is just what is Colocluse IP space? We should announce that to our upstream. Second term is are there Colocluse downstream uh, people? We, we sponsor some transit to a research project, for instance, and through communities we know what to propagate where. Then the interesting part comes. If the protocol is that black hole protocol that we defined earlier, and it's a slash 32, and it's within Colocluse IP space, then add a selective black hole BGP community. So you see there are multiple checks to ensure that we'll never start or attempt to black hole something that is not our own space. Then the term continues. If the net length is 24, and it's a more specific of our supernets, then accept and propagate it uh, to the upstream. So it is on eBHP outbound that we uh, manipulate the routes in such a way that one is actually triggering a selective black hole at the upstream and the other just exists to uh, suck in the traffic. But under normal circumstances, this term catches uh, all those, uh, would not allow the more specifics to propagate. And then, of course, 
If it doesn't meet any of these conditions, then just it's garbage. What is selective black holing? In a nutshell, it's a cheap DDoS damage control mechanism. What our upstream offers is uh, if you tag a route with a specific community, within a radius of a thousand kilometers, uh, it will be forwarded as if nothing is the matter. But outside that radius, on IBGP in all the boxes they have in different continents, we'll insert uh, the route as a discard route rather than a forwarding route. And this means, because most DDoS attacks are, come from all over the world, people use amplifiers, they are cheap, they don't care about latency because as long as enough packets arrive, good. So the DDoS really comes in from all around the world and during this DDoS, uh, we want to remain reachable in the West European region, but for those 60 seconds that we're mitigating, we could do without North American traffic or without Asian traffic. So most participants won't even really notice in practice that they have been attacked and that a mitigation was put in place because they are located in the Netherlands and they can still connect to their machine and go about their business. So this is a highly effective method to deal with large volume attacks without sacrificing too much connectivity. So the tools to build this, I like BERT because it offers extreme flexibility in terms of the routing policy and injecting stuff. FastNetmon, this is the, uh, the source code. It's quite easy to install, especially if you go to this URL that offers a fancy web 2.0 uh, style page. There is like five steps to follow. You just copy paste them and off you go. And you can copy my shell script from these slides or the bird conflicts from these slides if you want to do so. Any questions? <laughs> Let me see. Uh, hi. Leuk, Prezo. How about IPv6 in the network? I'm, are you still a believer? <laughs> <laughs> so FastNetmon um, today does not offer IPv6 support. And the reason is uh, the, the memory structure they chose uh, to, to implement this, those, you, you feed it a list of these are my IP addresses and you should count for these IP addresses. And what it does is it has a small memory, in-memory database and it expands all those IP blocks into the individual IP addresses. So in this case, it's 4,000 IPs, or is it 8,000? One of the two. <laughs> so you have 8,000 entries in the in-memory database, and every time a packet comes in, it will make uh, a note, <coughs> like in a ledger, uh, like how many bytes, how many flows, how many packets. And it works brilliantly for IPv4. I mean, you can easily store the entire IPv4 address space with that method in memory. Now, come IPv6, it's too large. It's useless. You cannot fit all possible variations in a 128-bit space. More memory. Add more memory, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I've, I've asked vendors for, I need a few petabytes. They're like, no, we're not doing it this year. So there is an issue open on GitHub about v6, um, and I'm, I'm engaging with the developer to figure out a way, because in reality, although the v6 address is 128 bits, we know, for instance, that the first 32 bits are static anyway, so we ignore those. And we know that you, on average, might hand out a slash 64 to a customer, or maybe a larger, a slash 48. So depending on your allocation scheme, there's really only between uh, 16 and 32 bits of actual customer identifiable entropy. And then we've reduced the problem back to IPv4 scale. So, but that still needs to be built. Uh, it's not impossible, but it needs some figuring out how to store this uh, in memory in an efficient way. So I hope next year there will be v6 support. Any more questions?
So you mentioned that you do actually um, trigger the slash 24 to draw the traffic to Ibernia. <coughs> um, that's because they offer the selective black holing. Correct. Is that still a transit only thing or are people starting to consider black holing for their peers as far as you are aware of? Um, there are some uh, community initiated projects, for instance, uh, Team Simru has a sort of BGP route server with eBGP multi-op sessions and that you can signal stuff to each other. Uh, but from my personal perspective, I wouldn't trust them. And it's very, very hard to validate uh, who is allowed to announce what and therefore who is allowed to insert which black holes. Because the moment somebody inserts 8888 uh, slash 32, uh, Google will be very angry. So I don't... It's, it's a complicated question, and I don't see uh, people wanting to, to touch that problem. And there's another perspective, uh, talking as NTT. For us, selective black holing uh, and normal black holing are uh, value-added services. So why would I give it away for free to appear if I can you know, use it as a unique selling point towards my customers? So from a marketing perspective, it doesn't make sense to offer your peers a lot of uh, features, such as BGP traffic engineering communities. You don't see that happen on peering relations. Uh, black holing, aside from the trust issue, there's a, a financial aspect. So I don't, I don't see this becoming popular in terms of peering. So I just want to add to that that there is an initiative in, in the IETF called DOTS, which is DDoS Open Threat Signaling, that uh, aims at kind of taking care of, of this issue. So it's, it's, a, it's a, signaling, a signaling mechanism uh, where, you, where you, the network's uh, peers as well as you know, suppliers and, and customers can notify each other of, of DDoS attacks. It's still you know, in the early stages, but if you're interested in the topic, I, I just... You know, get involved in the IETF, right, in the DOTS working group. But why would you? I mean, if my peer signals to me, oh, I'm under attack, I'm like, good for you, man. Oh, well, you want help? <laughs> Here's a quote. <laughs> sure, it depends on who you are, right? But I mean, it, it, I, I think yeah. that, you know, it, it, especially in, in Europe, there are, uh, you know, literally hundreds or, or thousands of, of service providers um, you know, we, we just look at AM6 or D6, there are so many members, uh, there, there's, you know, in the community, people like helping out, having an open peering policy. This is true. Other places in the world, that's not true. I mean, in the US, it's, you know, more of these very large providers that, you know, look more at ec economic incentive for yep. things. Um, so th there might be, you know, there might be an issue here where, where uh, service providers actually are looking to help out because, we help out, you know, this day and tomorrow they'll help, help us out, hopefully. Excellent point. Thank you for bringing this up. More questions? So everybody is going to deploy this tomorrow? <laughs> no. Let me know if you have <laughs> questions on how to uh, get this running, should you run into trouble. But I can highly recommend this software. Uh, as, as I said, it's easy and cheap. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna make a, a bit of a, you know an ad here for for a personal software project. So if I understand in your case, Stand up. you're sorry, yeah, uh, you're a bit low on on uh, uh, peering bandwidth, I suppose, which is why you're you're propagating all these black hole routes to your upstreams and letting them handle the issue. Uh, if you're in the situation where you do have a lot of kind of border capacity, so you can actually, you know, receive this entire attack, but then you're in the situation, what do I do with it, right? Uh, black holing, as you mentioned, is one thing. If you can do it uh, within a radius, uh, th that's pretty sweet, but often I see people implementing uh, just basic black holing, it's on the destination prefix, and by doing that, you're actually completing the DDoS attack. I mean, that's, yeah, that's what happens. So. Um, a while ago, I wrote this little thing. It's using Snap Switch. That's a, a fast, you know, packet processing framework. Uh, and I wrote a small application that looks. It does pretty much the same thing as fast, not fast netmon. So you know, you, you reach a thre threshold, and 
at that point, it starts dropping the traffic. Uh, it does this for 60 seconds and then, you know, continues. So this is something that you would run on your servers and, and I mean, x86 PCs are pretty cheap these days. So it's actually feasible to, you know, have a couple of hundred gigabits of, of DDoS mitigation using this. Still pretty, and pretty basic. And it starts rate limiting the sources. So, right, so, so it's looking at the source addresses. So when a source address is sending more than X amount of traffic, then that source is black hole. So for anyone that is, uh, well, I mean, your legitimate users, uh, they're probably believe, uh, be, uh, below these thresholds, so then it's fine. It will just pass that traffic right through. All right, thank you. What is the name of this project? Uh, uh. <laughs> so, uh, Sna oh, wait, what is it called? Uh, DDoS, <laughs> DDoS Stop. <laughs> DDoS I Stop. Yeah. Sounds cool? Oh, yeah. Thank you. It is. Um, and to add to that, if you were to implement something similar to this mechanism on, on modern edge routers, this is a very complicated task because if there's anything they hate, it's maintaining state. And by pushing this problem to the far end servers that actually serve the content, uh, maintaining state about what source IP address does what uh, becomes a more scalable uh, approach. So I like the approach. I might try it out. Now, next up, we have more about DDoS. Thomas, will you come to the stage? Thank you. <laughs> 